This is the Garden Cinema Film Talk, presented by Michael Chambers and Abla Kandalaft. We chat with filmmakers, actors, producers and film commentators about the art of film. We talk about the films they made, how they made them and the ones they'd like to make. This week, Michael and I are chatting to Tom Stoughton and Tom Palmer, the screenwriting duo behind the film All My Friends Hate Me. Thank you very much, Tom and Tom. Thanks for joining us. I see you have a glass of wine. We're not used to, to having um, wine presented to us. So that's, <laughs> I, I hope that's a kind of, a pre, you know, that's, we can expect that at all. Uh, these things. Future but, podcast. Um, I just say I love comedy. I, I always have. It's always been my favourite since I was a kid. And... Um, I'm an old man now, so I've seen generations of comedy. And what interests me is how um, how comedy changes with the generations. Because I was at at the LSE in this uh, from sixty sixty three, just when Beyond the Fringe came down from um, Edinburgh and installed itself across the other side of Kingsway in the uh, the, the uh, theatre there. And I went to it three times. I couldn't get enough of it. And Peter Cook was such a genius. And um, Miller, the pianist. Um, Dudley, <laughs> Dudley, Dudley Moore. Moore. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a classic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and of course, that was the humour of my generation, mm. the sort of satire of the Beyond the Fringe. Did you ever hear the Chris Morris um, uh, team up with Peter Cook, where it was Chris, Chris, Chris Morris and Peter Cook, and, and they did a whole sort of... Radio why, interview. Why bother? Thing. Why bother? Yeah. yeah. No, what I, I I was more aware of, of uh, Cook and Dudley Moore. Yeah. Pete and Dud, unbeatable, oh. really. For yeah, me, yeah. for that generation, yeah. Peter Cook was the genius. Yeah. And then it changed, and uh, that was the 60s. And the 70s, well, of course, the 60s was a, a decade of great humor and uh, vivacity and, uh, and letting everything go, you know. Um, the 70s turned rather sour because the big recession of the early 70s mm. and then by 79 it turned even more sour and you had a Tory government that was very uh, what can you say almost malicious <laughs> and uh, and then the 80s again there was different humor and I lost touch with humor a bit then because I I wasn't really in with the 80s style it all seemed very angry to me just like punk rock had produced angry music, you had a sort of punk humour. So I wondered, you yourself, you've been in humour, what, 20 odd years now? 20 mm-hmm. years? Well, I suppose yeah. if, you, if you include us meeting yeah. as, yeah, as, teenagers, as teenagers. Even teenagers at the university, yeah. Yeah. you yeah. were doing yeah. it? Yeah. I um, saw a, <laughs> a, very, a very funny clip on television where you're sitting in an art class at university. <laughs> well, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it was wonderful. Uh, and yeah. the... <laughs> There's this older student next to you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Our, old, our old drama teacher. Who yeah, we yeah. 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 Oh, and yeah. I thought um, that was so funny. Oh, good. Yeah. Thank you. And what, what's your thesis on? It's Banksy. On, on Banksy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 and, and of course, the tutor didn't know what to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I think an alarm went off then to your rescue. And it was, yeah, yeah. No, I thought that was, so I thought that, was funny, it? and I thought, well... You've but, both been in this a long time. It was well, that's true, yeah. and that was yeah. That was I. I read history of art at Bristol, and you know there was um when we made that clip, and uh, it was very closely based on a guy in my class, and it, it was actually quite awkward when it came out and went viral because I had to ah. sort of sit opposite him, <laughs> yes. you know, for the rest of the year. Uh, and, but you know, like 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 often happens with these things. He eventually came up to me and went, "Mate, it's such a funny video. <laughs> Who, who's it based on?" And, and you kind of realise that these, you know, people never really think. They either think, "Oh, that was on me, wasn't it?" Or yeah. they just kind of have that blind spot. Well, that's the risk of doing satire. Yeah, yeah. but it's yeah. interesting. I mean, referencing, you know, beyond the fringe, like I guess everything does change generation to generation. But they were still kind of lampooning deluded upper class people yeah. that were mm. kind of trying trying to be you know there's that famous one with the pianist where the guy's trying to be hip and sort of yeah. trying to you know interrogate the meaning of the song and um and uh you know all, all i mean you know peter cook's famous for kind of satirizing the upper classes and um 
uh, and all that kind of bombastic sort of thing that's going on in the in the 50s and 60s so i think and i think you know that that character we were just talking about who's doing his um uh, history of art thesis on on yeah. banksy it's it's the yeah. same kind of satire it's like yeah. you know these people in you know positions of privilege that are just very deluded about the Del- world. delusion seems like the common thread even david brent who's not posh you know the whole joke we seem to love watching people you know be deluded that's yeah. i don't know why that's so funny to us and it's certainly funny to me and tom yeah. anyway um just someone trying to be something they're not is, yeah. is so rich to to the british kind of i don't know what that says it'd be really interesting to get to the bottom of why we're so obsessed with that but um well the mix of humor and satire in uh, all my friends hate me yeah was wonderful i loved it great thank satire you. on the the generation that's all talking about what they're saying about being yourself and yeah <laughs> this this um fig who's yeah. talking to you yeah. all about being herself and so yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's but it but to a sort of absurd degree where she's like i don't actually care about anything at all yeah. um and it sort of goes, spins off it spins him out even more yeah um yeah and i think i think now is a particularly interesting time to talk about class guilt and maybe a sort of the sort of context now can can be a bit darker because we are all sort of it's a moment to self-reflect a lot more and 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 the sort of engine of social media means that there feels like there are so many more eyes on us the whole time and we're sort of scrutinizing ourselves and you can't get away with you know anything anymore there's that and i think that sort of feeds a lot of pete's view of the world that's warped by this kind of guilt it's this kind of paranoia that he'll be exposed for something that happened at some point which you sort of there is a specific thing but it's not the thing as you find out um, without wanting to give too much away yeah, so yeah, yeah i think i think it's an interesting time to to explore that the anxiety surrounding class was that your starting point for the script of this film it was it was kind of that i mean we we having made that video that you saw we and then spent sort of 10 years you know arguably maybe sort of approaching writing in, in a slightly cynical way of like okay what what's kind of going to be cool what a commission is going to get and realizing that we that was a harder you know it was hard to to think of stuff that that we could write authentically we were like let's let's get back to something that we can write ourselves and make ourselves with some mates in a house so there was that those kind of limitations were one starting point for for the setup basically you know let's think about the the premise of something that at the very least we can film on an iphone and call in our friends to to help out um but then i guess those themes just kind of came about there was a sto- there is a story um where i went to a wedding and um was invited by two old uh uni friends that i'd slightly drifted apart from and i was slightly surprised to be invited um and i stupidly made the mistake of going out the night before the wedding and um was feeling very fragile at it and became increasingly paranoid that I'd been invited as a joke and that the groom was going to announce during the speeches that it was, isn't it hilarious that Tom Sturton thinks he's he's here for real and I told this to Tom and he, and he pointed out how deeply narcissistic that was to, to be thinking but it kind of it, that that kind of idea of a fun event feeling anything but and the way that you can experience a horror film in your own head um, was interesting so it was a kind of mixture of of things that sort of gave gave rise to the script yeah i guess it was the anxiety first it was that feeling that sort of curious feeling that is both you know can be looked at from a different perspective and and be seen to be narcissistic and funny but also when experienced firsthand can feel deeply horrifying and horrible and so the film's always trying to yeah tread the line between those two feelings you know the 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 the, the humor of of Pete's kind of self involvement, and then the horror of what's actually happening to him through his eyes, um, and the kind of dichotomy of those two things, we hope makes people feel anxious and paranoid right to the end. Yeah, I was going to pick up on that and say you managed to communicate that to the viewer really, really well. I was particularly impressed at how layered it became as as the minutes ticked by. Initially, you go in thinking the story is going to play out in a certain way. And then layer upon layer, it it creates a sense of unease and anxiety. And then the story becomes more and more complex. I don't know if you found that as well, Michael. Yeah, I would put it slightly differently. I think, um, because I've seen it twice now. And um, the first time I saw it, I thought, 
we've got an a, an interesting situation here where uh, the fellow turns up at a grand house to reunite with friends he was really close with at university all those years ago, and he's going to rebond with them, and it's going to be a great birthday celebration. And then he finds that, this is how I saw it the first time round, he finds that they they devising some sort of uh, some sort of um, prank, some sort of conspiracy to um, have a joke at his expense, really. And they use various tricks to do this. They they say that um, his ex girlfriend um, tried to commit suicide just as he was leaving her, leave going away which, of course, was a terrible thing to say to him, but this was the first thing. Um, they would all... They brought this comedian along who would steal his thunder and, and interrupt him whenever he was about to tell a story. They would... Um, one of the girls, a fig, I think it was, on the stairs, turns round to him after the late in the evening and says, you really haven't performed well. You've let us all down. Um, yeah. All these things which clearly indicated to me that they'd got together and said, well, let's have some fun at his expense. He deserves it because, after all, he was the skipper in the old days and now um, we can have a bit of fun and get and do this to him. And, and then at the end of it, the first time I saw it, I thought, well, hang on, um, it's got very serious here and he's he's almost had a breakdown and, uh, and so on. And... Um, and then they brought forth this fake, this fake Pete, to really humiliate him to an extent that was just painful. And then I thought, well, is this not really a prank? It's them being re being how they feel about him. Then I saw it the second time, and I thought, well, actually, now I see it. I think that this probably wasn't a prank. This was how they actually felt about him, and he was so. Um, narcissistic if you like so full of himself uh, he couldn't cope with this and they were they were in a way but the trouble was of course you never got the backstory so you never knew what had happened at university the, to prompt them to come out with this rather uh, f friendly hatred if you know what i mean mm. um it's an interesting phrase friend friendly hatred i think it, it's yeah it's uh it sums up i think that weird um, tradition that that see, that maybe is more happens more with kind of I don't know, rugby clubs the upper class yeah. um, of 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 showing love by by um, being cruel to someone there's all yeah. sort of taking the piss this kind of British institution that's taking it, it, the piss we were never sure whether it was malicious or not that's the yeah. thing I think that's where it was so interesting y yeah. to the viewer that's the bind that Pete is in that you know if he feels like if he were to at any point challenge the joke. He would look mad and he would look like he's not being fun and he's ruining the party or whatever. And so that's what kind of drives him into this internal neurosis that sort yeah. of spirals out of control is that he never has the courage to but say. But is this a joke or is it, are they, this is what I couldn't, even now I don't quite know the answer, I can't quite work it out, having seen it twice. Are they being themselves and really feeling that he's getting what he really deserves, bring him down a peg or two, or is this just people who like him but having a joke? Yeah, exactly, I guess, how we want you to feel <laughs> yeah. both those things, <laughs> yeah. because that is what Pete experiences, that's what's driving yeah. him so mad, is he cannot work out which is real. And But in the car at the end, the, mm. the punchline at the very end of the film mm. is you can't take a joke. Yeah, yeah. 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 And that you felt, wonder then... That felt like the scariest th option is that, that you, you would never know. In the same way that that's sort of what is I see, yeah. what makes paranoia so scary yeah, is, yeah, is the not yeah. knowing. So what felt truest to the sort of the film's um, message was it was an ending that was open and kind of yeah. the implication was that this guy well, is going to go that on. That got into his right. head, into Pete's head, and that's how Pete would have felt at the end of it. Were th were they uh, just having a prank at my expense, or were they? Is this how they really <laughs> yeah. feel about me? Yeah. Yeah, and he, you know, without giving any spoilers away, he is carrying this sort of guilt of something really horrible that he did yeah. do, and I think that is probably what is still driving him to yeah. worry. At the end, is this a? 
deep conspiracy? Does that yeah. line, you can't take a joke, have something to do with what I did? And yeah, is this yeah. all a long punishment that's been sort of deeply ingrained in my life for a long time? Yeah, because there is still the potential interpretation that, that Harry is in fact the brother of the girl who yeah, was involved yeah. in this terrible thing and, and has decided to lie in that moment. Yeah, and like yeah. I think we tried in the plotting of it to to make sure that, that there could be multiple interpretations do make sense but none, none of them are for certain. Yeah, because their barking like a dog didn't make sense. It did, The explanation didn't actually right. work yeah. so you yeah. felt. And, yeah. and the, and the uh, plastic on, uh, bag mm -hmm. on his head as well. Mm -hmm. so you felt, well hang on, this doesn't work, make sense either that mm -hmm. he's yeah. not the person. Who... Yeah. So it did leave you very much feeling like Pete for felt in yes. the car yeah. Yeah. well that's good I'm yeah. glad I mean it's it's always odd isn't it being like I'm glad that you felt horrible during it's a kind of <laughs> odd thing to wish on someone but yeah I think it is it is the film's uh, without wanting to sound big headed success is that it when people uh, ha when it has an effect on people it's to really immerse them inside this guy's head and his experience I thought the film as a whole was extremely well very professional goodness me the editing the acting everyone acted it so well um well, especially the lead. I mean, yeah. You I carried, that, you had to carry the whole yeah. film, really. But, well, uh, it was such a relief on the first day and watching everyone else perform. I mean, we we were lucky enough to to have for, to, for the budget to stretch towards a proper casting process and yeah. see, getting tapes sent in and, um, and a fantastic casting director. Um, so we knew everyone was good, but it was just a real relief when we saw how good they were at, because I think without that that yeah. like really strong supporting. Yeah. group of people who, who who were able to achieve that sort of sense of them being friends and um the film would have it would have been yeah. the film's downfall so and every single one of them we had that kind of cliche experience of you know they did the scene in the room and, and we we're just like that's him yeah. that is george that yeah. is archie did you have to do lots of takes um yes yeah, so there were a lot that we saw a lot of people um no, i mean it, in the filming oh, oh, I, right, actually, oh, yeah. I did andrew gave it to to, yeah. to be fair i got <laughs> the most takes so <laughs> yeah so I was at an advantage. I should come clean and say that, like, we tried to get as many options in the can as possible, time allowing, so so that in the edit, you know, they could yeah. they could be like, okay, we need to. This is too nasty. Let's do the cut slightly more comedic version and vice versa. Uh, I see. So you had the really hard version and the and the, yeah. the genial version. Yeah, yeah exactly. the slightly more yeah. sympathetic. Yeah, yeah. Like we need to feel a bit more sorry for Pete here. Okay, let's make him uh -huh. a bit more hard done by. I do. I, I feel, feel that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. he comes across a very sympathetic character. Right. Okay. He tries yeah. his best. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, that's the thing. You can't judge him for that. He's <laughs> trying to be yeah. better, but he's also just being so forced and fake in the process that you yeah. kind of do think, oh, you're a bit of a prat as well. I'm curious to see how the collaboration happened because you've already worked with Andrew. Yeah, yeah, on, so, on a couple of things. Yeah. yeah, so did you ask him to be mm. the director on your script? Yeah. We did, yeah. He was, he was back from L.A., having filmed some big kind of TV stuff there. I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, but he was in a kind of classic, you know, back from LA disillusioned, like, um, I don't want to do these these big budget, lovely, glossy things anymore. I've lost touch with my own sort of comedic sensibility. And so the, the timing with that was right, just because he was looking to do something weird uh, for no money, basically. Um, and, we, and so yeah. we put the script in front of him. Yeah, well, we just, we went for a drink with him one night. And at that point, we were co quite committed to this idea of, right, we're just going to shoot this ourselves and film it on iPhones and whatever. We were talking about the, this process and saying, you know, I guess we just need, you know, maybe we're not so confident at like how to point the camera and what to do. And Andrew was sat right next to us and he was like, guys, I am, I am a director. That's actually like what I do for a living. Maybe you should send me the script and, we, and, I, and I can read it. And luckily he loved it and, and got really on board after that. Yeah, it resonates well with the type of things he's filmed before. I'm thinking obviously of Stuff Let's Flats, yeah. the type of kind of awkwardness in his, his sense of humour. Yeah. Have you seen CG eyebrows? It was his first clip. It's a, it's a, the premises is a bunch of actors who've had their eyebrows CGI'd into like into expressions. <laughs> I'm just I just want to keep giving that a shout out whenever I can because it's worth a look. But where is it? It's on YouTube, oh, it's on I YouTube. think. Yeah. Okay. And it's sort of what launched him He's got lots of really funny clips and stuff floating around out there. And um, he 100% was was like his comedic sensibility was so important in in the edit, especially because scenes, it was very overwritten, the script. Um, and the scenes when we filmed them were very kind of long and dialogue heavy. And, and, and he was able just to get in there and be like, no, lose it, lose it and be ruthless and be like, let's what, 
the scene is overstaying its welcome and actually the film's energy i think is is really dependent on his on his comic timing yeah very visual yeah yeah and, th- and that that pat so like the pat the buttons bit was his idea he was like i just think it'd be really funny for you to lose your mind about how many buttons to do up and and that my favorite shot which is where it pans very slowly around t- to reveal the gamekeeper norman stood behind me while i'm telling the story that was like he was dead set on that shot and yeah we we lost a lot of time setting up the using the right word dolly here to, yeah um, was a dolly, to, yeah. to, to, <laughs> <laughs> to come around but like you know then you watch it and like i'm so grateful for, for his for his vision on stuff moments like that yeah. the the scene of the hunt of the the shooting of the pheasants that 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 they knew he didn't like shooting didn't they yeah again it's that is what actually an area i'm i in myself am in two minds about the scene when i when, when they're all horrible to him because he can't shoot well is maybe the moment when the film comes becomes in my mind the most surreal because it's like as an audience member you're like there's why are they now now this is really weird but i suppose it was um it was supposed to be just that thing of like when when there's all, something about organized fun that can be anything but i in my experience just like when you know when i don't know if you've been on like holiday and someone's like hey come play volleyball it'll yeah. be fun yeah and then you know people suddenly take it very seriously and it's not fun yeah. and you feel kind of inadequate it was just tapping into that feeling really that moment um but yeah the logic of it is is up for interpretation i think tom what yeah. do you, and what, yeah, what do you i guess it's it? all it was also just a a device to put pete in you know in this horrible bind where you know he wants wants to be woke and progressive and kind of like um, discerning of what's going on. But at the same time, he suddenly realizes he's in the countryside and he's confronted with this gamekeeper that he's already offended and has put this whole thing on yeah. for him. And so it, it was to yeah give him that, that sort of, sort of towny thing of like shooting's awful, but then, you know, you speak to someone who actually lives in the countryside yeah. and, and, and they and suddenly you get you're, awkward you're, about you're, that. your own, yeah, li- sort of liberalism. I, I was amused how, um, I imagine this was perhaps second thoughts, where you, 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 well, whoever decided, they had to lighten it with some light classical music. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, no, it's good. That's otherwise, a, it might have been just a bit too yeah, heavy. Yeah, yeah, totally. I that's a really good that was, point. Um, yeah. I think there was a cut where it was he- where it had heavy music and it was all spooky and. But it, instead, you had killing these birds to the entertainment of yeah, this light. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Music um, which which pulled it through, as mm, it were. Yeah, and I think that was a just a common. Um, Technique for all, all the all the music, you know, juxtaposed yeah. with the action. So you know, yeah, the barbarity of the shooting and the lightness of the classical yeah. music, and equally, as Tom's always mentioned, the 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 buttons. It, that's a sort of funny comic moment, but it's got this kind yeah, of harsh was... horror score going on behind it. <laughs> yeah. That was like, classic oh. Charlie Chaplin. That was <laughs> yeah, yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. very fashion, yeah. When you was... when you wrote the script, you it, this whole question of of, of um. A prank or, or real or mm. dark or light. Um, you must have fluctuated all the way through writing it in about that. In terms of what we thought it was, either well, way. Well, thinking it's one and then coming mm. a week later and thinking, no, no, we. I think this we're a bit more light. It's, in other words, the the sort of the mystery that still hangs around the ending must have been there with you from the beginning. Yeah. It was. It was a real lesson in writing the ending before you make the <laughs> the film because because we you know the nature of the film's tension is unanswered questions so the that's that's all very well and good but then you when you don't have a satisfying ending to that it's like suddenly quite tricky so we were always in, in the in the writing of it we were always trying to make sure that things were like yeah. plausible either way so you didn't, but you didn't know the ending at, when you started. You didn't know how to end we, it. No, we didn't. I no. just, we were literally just um, chasing that feeling, which is difficult. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, really and in some ways, we kind of we ended it multiple ways over the over the course of the writing process, and yeah. we kind of in the end settled on ending it with with all those potential endings still going on. There was one where it really was about something he did to Claire and they were punishing him for that. That thread's still kind of in there, but obviously it's... Well, of course, the ending that was missing was he throws this rather heavy jar Mm. at the back of his head. It it obviously does some damage. And then it's cut, and and then yeah. he's in the car. So. I should say that D- Dustin happened? was genuinely injured, but that, that it was a it was 
budget didn't allow for sugar glass. That was a wax vase. And, yeah. and if you w- watch it again um, and imagine how angry Dustin is as he goes down <laughs> out of shot, it's, it's kind of doubly amusing. Did you just get um, that one take? Uh, oh, luckily I did it first take. Yeah, and poor, poor Dustin. Yeah, luckily. You, anyway, um, no, you, were you going to say that, like, you, you, is he dead? Is he alive? Is he, how badly injured is he? There, there was a scene that w- was in there where it's a, a last dinner scene and you hear at the beginning of it, Dustin sort of leaving and he's like, sorry, I'm not going to press charges. I'm okay. And, you know, but it just seemed to slow down. What felt the funniest was like that awful moment and then a hard cut to yeah. Pete in a car saying that very pathetic kind of excuse for a line I, i'm so hung over um just felt like a funnier cut but it's yeah did you find it distracting not knowing what was no happening no to... no no i was just interested to see how no i agree that dinner scene would have been a damp ending mm-hmm. yes mm-hmm. yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was all about how he wasn't going to press charges and how that was so yeah. great of him to do well, that and who know, cares just, uh... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So tell me how going back to the, what I said at the beginning about the the way humor seems to change and shift from generation to generation how do you see it at the moment shifting or evolving well do well I guess like our film is probably quite a cynical film um it sort of indulges in in cruelty in quite a masochistic way and and maybe that feels like something that wasn't so present in maybe some of our some comedies we really like uh, from like I don't know the nineties or whatever like Four Weddings or whatever there 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 was a much more kind of sugar coated sort of um, tone to those films even though we love them they're so funny and, and maybe we've entered into a slightly more cynical darker world of comedy right now but I don't know what would you what would you say Tom um, yeah I mean I love Stathlet's Flats and I love and it's, it's it's really interesting watching something like The Office now, the British Office. And like, actually, I, sometimes I watch that and I'm like, gosh, this is this is hard to uh, hard to watch. And, and sometimes I wonder if I have now a, a lower threshold for cruelty, even having made this film. Um, but I think in terms of what interests us more and more, it's 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 films um, that are a little less clearly comedy, uh, like like um, Force Majeure. I don't know if you've seen that. And the, it, it's sort of it's it shouldn't be funny but it, it's um i think dra- drama is a, is a is a is the best influence to comedy basically we're, we're finding drawing on really serious films it feels like you've got like a lot of pathos there good to go and then i i basically the stuff that i i'm i'm feel myself losing touch with comedy myself i guess I, I, aside from Stathlet's flats and alan partridge which i'm still obsessed with um more and more like what interests me is actually i don't i'm going to speak for tom but quite sort of weird dramas and 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 um stuff like um Joanna Hogg's films they they feel quite funny to me oddly and i don't know why that is particularly they're not they're certainly not advertisers comedies but just something about very repressed english people is to me feels funny do you um, do you know the Duplass brothers yes. films yeah, yeah. have you watched baghead no well your film re- tonally it reminded me right. of baghead where they manage what is usually very difficult, yeah. balancing the very scary moments with the very funny right. ones. They're, they're brilliant, those guys. Brilliant. And yeah, also we're, you know, just massive fans of the way that they have, you know, handled their career and, and kept creative control throughout and sort of built their productions themselves. And, and that In was very um, different formats and very different yeah, genres as exactly. well. Exactly. Always keep, yeah, keep you surprised. And yeah. yeah. But in terms of uh, British comedy influences, I definitely saw, you know, the, Alan Partridge type humour also saw some Peep Show yeah. Mm, type. Yeah, yeah. and the button thing did remind me of a scene in Peep Show right? Uh, oh, really? where Jeremy tries different levels of buttoning oh really oh god oh, right. it's, it's yeah, been yeah. done so then. go back yeah. to oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm going to question <laughs> Andrew on that actually yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but that biting yeah, satirical yeah, humour yeah. and they're so in their own heads and, obviously yeah. in that and it's so fun hearing that in a monologue they have and hopefully in our film, you can kind of see Pete's inner monologue going on and how he's overanalyzing and overthinking. Where, uh, where, where do you think we're at in terms of comedy yeah. trends at the moment? Well, it was that's, that's partly why it was such a delight to see your film. Oh, <laughs> because it, it uh, made me think that satire and, and humor is, is, uh, is the thing, is where we're at now. And uh, 
I see comedy as being either humour or wit, and the French have a, a monopoly on wit, and, and the Irish and the English had a strong place in humour. Yeah. An Italian lady saw it and came out at a Q&A recently. She came up and she said, I, she was like, I, I'm married to an Englishman and I'm so sick of them constantly telling me that they're just joking. It's not funny. Uh, <laughs> what, you know, um, it's just, you, guys, you guys are weird. Uh, and she said, in Italy, we just say how we feel. We don't, you know, we're not constantly doing this. Oh, I'm only joking thing. And uh, yeah, he's the husband sort of sheepishly said, well, I wish your relatives joked more personally. But um, yeah. <laughs> it was just, it was just, I think it is a real cultural thing british humor is very specific um yeah. that's interesting about yeah you're right the french are pretty pretty uh, articulate actually talking about translation of humor michael you pointed out that a lot of the reviews came from the states so yeah, your film seems to be here. very <laughs> successful <laughs> with american audiences i was thinking how compared to the reviews you get in england i've got the ones i like there's variety here which is terrific there's the new york times the Screen Daily. I don't know if you've read these, but um, and the very good one from something called Culture Vulture, and Indie Wire, and are very um, intelligent reviews. They they're uh, amazing. Did you go to America when it was released in Tribeca? Yeah, we did, yeah. Well, I I did. Um, it was during the pandemic. I have a U.S. passport just by chance. I was born there completely randomly, and um, so Tom sadly couldn't come. But yeah, it was it was really cool that they picked it up. Uh, and I think it was uh, something about an East East Coast tradition of being very neurotic that yeah. meant that they could relate to it. I think um, yeah. I'm not sure how well the, the touch of Woody Allen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so it's kind of just an accident that it got released in the US first. It's just that happened to be the festival we launched at, and obviously that's where the American distributors were, um, and they got first dibs. And and so um, yeah, it's funny to to have that way round. But I think it kind of has worked to our benefit as, as you say we've got some really nice reviews out of there and that's helped kind of market it over here and get the trailer ready and things like that so um but yeah we were surprised how well it how well it went down over yeah, there what did, what did people say what did the americans say when they'd seen it how did they what did they say to you we we did a q a we both went to new york uh, during its release and we did a q a at the angelica theater and all the questions were great it feels like there's enough universal themes in like it, they really picked up on that thing of the 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 moment of turning 30 in your life or, or early yeah, 30s yeah. and the way in yeah, which yeah. that's a moment that is, is itself kind of anxiety inducing because you're 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 inclined to compare your where your life's at with your peers a bit more at that point you yeah. sort of check in with you know your successes and your career and your, whether you've got a family well i i can remember when i turned 30 it was horrible because <laughs> you're still young yeah. in your 20s but somehow you can't kid yourself when this horrible 30 yeah, turns yeah, that's you true. just can't you, and yeah you can't go out anymore without feeling deeply depressed about um, <laughs> uh, I noticed one thing in reading all these American reviews. I got the feeling that the distributor in the States had been labelling this as a horror film because they're all saying horror, horror, horror. And, and then I read some of the reviews by viewers, you know, the audience reviews, and they were saying, no, this wasn't a horror film. This, you can never call this a horror yes, film. Yes, we're learning how how um, passionate horror fans are about not missed, <laughs> not <laughs> getting, getting that wrong. Guts at the end uh, of the yeah, I mean, it was a, there was a debate. I mean, it, it's I guess we would call it like a dark psychological social horror, but that's not really a kind of genre you can click on IMDb. Um, and so there was some debate about whether to include horror as part of the description and. You know, I think part of the marketing plan is that that should be a point of discussion. You know, it, it, it is a film about sort of it, Pete's inner neurosis, but these trivial things he experiences play out like a horror. And, um, you know, this thing about the buttons we keep talking about, that, that kind of feels like it's got the stakes of a, of a horror film, like something, something is going to happen. And that feeling of dread um, that, you know, there is an impending doom awaiting this character is actually we find more frightening than revealing the monster in the horror film. So to us, yeah, it does stay in the realms of horror in that it portrays a nightmare and a nightmare that never ends. And to me, that's that's deeply scary. A bit of a comedy of manners as well. Yeah, yeah. The manners of, not the millennial age, what, what are they called just before the millennials? The, 
Well, so that's not Gen, Generation X. Gen, I think these Gen are millennials, um, yeah. but yeah, I always get confused by the cutoff point. Born, born but, um, after 1980, I think, is millennial. Oh, right. right. So, there you go. Yeah. Right. So these are these are millennials. Yeah. yeah, who I think are sort of um, yeah, as as Tom was saying, that that age of they've got to 30, they're not young anymore. They're certainly not students anymore, and yet most of them are still clinging on to this quite obnoxious kind of way of interacting that they just feel like they can't let go of and pete's tried to distance himself from that but that is kind of what drives him mad and makes him so anxious is that he's he's trying to raise himself above them and virtue signal that he's better yeah. than them but that sort of gets they him into listen. trouble no. yeah <laughs> i was intrigued to know uh about your respective careers so tom you mainly worked as an actor in the last few years um how about you tom palmer for listeners um you're also an actor and a comedian. Did you not think of casting yourself in um, one of the roles? There, there were, there was a, ver- you know, as I as I was saying earlier, there was this version where we'd shoot it on iPhones and we'd, you know, just get it done in a week um, with no budget. Um, and I probably would have been in that, and I would have enjoyed doing that. But when the um, production just started to gather steam, and this, you know, Andrew's on board, and the cast was attached, and the budget was going up and I was producing it, it suddenly felt like I would have no headspace to do a performance at the same time as producing. And I'm so glad I took that decision. And I thought maybe on set I would feel, you know, like I had the itch to get in front of the camera, but I never did. There's too much to think about. And I'm quite a control freak. So I think I quite enjoyed (laughs) this like new power of being like off the camera and in charge of so much of the other creative things of the project. There's that dynamic changing uh, or changeable rather, I should say, so you're happy to act, write, direct? Or... Yeah, definitely. I'm open to it for, for sure. I mean, Tom has never been as nice to me as on this film when he was the producer and I was the actor. Um, so I really enjoy the dynamic. Um, but um, yeah, I think Tom and I, um, and we, 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 we'd love to go back to doing some live stuff as well, I think, as a, as a, as a, as a double act. I think where we, where we were at creatively before we wrote it, we were just slightly tired with, with with doing that and um you know it's it's talk about turning 30 it's like a it feels like a young man's game the sketch thing i we you know sort of going out and performing in pubs across london that you have to you have to really love that the the kind of um the scene and, and the atmosphere of that and tom and i were always quite nerve nervy performers um did you film any of those sketches? Uh, we d- we did, yeah, we did. We had a pilot with Channel Four that I think is is I don't know where that is now, and um, that was sort of our live show filmed. But it was, you know, it puts a strain on on a friendship being like right working and traveling and 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 I think um, and also and when drinking. you're and drinking, <laughs> yeah, and you're you're kind of um, that thing of like, which is I think it's a competitive writing style is 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 key to a lot of good comedy because you're. You're constantly driving the other person to, to think of a funnier line, but it's also exhausting to be, you know. And and when we wrote this film, it was such a release to just be like, let's not not worry about who gets the punchline here. Let's just um, write the best script possible. How does your humour differ between you? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, um, yeah, I, I think um, I think you, yeah, I think Tom probably does. Um, you, you're more into the more kind of outlandish weirder comedies whereas i, I mean like i love something like veep or um uh flight of the concords or stuff like that which maybe you yeah, like flight, less flight than like it's very whimsical isn't it yeah. yeah i don't know i'm thinking about more of the sort of surreal stuff right. i don't know yeah, um, yeah. Maybe, uh, well, i guess was i more of a sort of league of gentlemen fan when we were uh yeah and... maybe more tom definitely more of a horror i think i have it yeah, yeah and that kind of I, I I like horror films a lot, um, and that those I think were swirling around more in my head as reference points than Tom in this. Do you ever do stand up, either of you? No, I mean, yeah, s- sketch comedy was kind of where was bad we enough when we had the line. It was <laughs> terrifying oh, no. enough, and at least you've got a fourth wall and some like scripted lines. Whereas stand up always it was yeah, the idea of dealing with hecklers. That was what was always terrified. We we would, and in a very kind of lame way, we'd be like, "This is the fourth wall, and we're going to pretend you didn't say anything." Yeah, never, <laughs> never came up with a witty yeah. comeback or anything like uh, that. We just, just plowed on, on, 
louder. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, well, stand up wouldn't be quite. No, right. no. Yeah. I mean, anyone that does that does that. I mean, and you have to really build your craft as well. And I feel like if you if having not just starting now would be insane. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're onto something much better. Now. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Just generally speaking, what what ambitions do you have we'd as, love film, to as make, filmmakers? Yeah, as we'd love to make another film, um, not necessarily in it or anything, but we'd love to write another film and team up with Andy. That'd be great. Yeah, the first thing we wrote afterwards was actually just a, a very uplifting, joyous rom com, which um, is uh, was like, totally different to the tone of this film, but was really refreshing to write this totally different uh, genre and tone. Um, and we're hoping that can get packaged up um and sort of made a slightly bigger budget project um but can, can you tell us anything uh it's about two geriatrics that um dine and dash from restaurants across the country running away from um yeah um angry restaurateurs and the police and falling in love along the way like it's a geriatric um, bonnie and clyde type <laughs> comedy yeah <laughs> A mild-mannered english bonnie and clyde um so that was really fun to write and then Probably more in keeping with the tone of this is a is a an idea we've got set at Christmas about a dysfunctional upper class family kind of falling apart over this supposedly joyful time of Christmas. Um, We're trying to cash in on the Christmas movie market, but but, yeah, but yeah, sort yeah, of yeah, take it down it from within. That's who put up the money for this. Um... So yeah, it was, it's privately financed by about thirty diff like individuals investing. You know, some people kind of tiny sums and some people a bit bigger and um you know the budget was really modest and tight um but that is the price we paid for all the creative control and did the two of you raise the money i mean was this I, a it, joint it effort? really yeah. is all on to, i have to say tom uh, is, is full credit where it's to you i did i did none of that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um so did you enjoy doing that side well i did uh, there were different the the first round of investment I enjoyed. The second round, after it had transpired that one of our film financiers, who was actually on set at the time, um, turned out to be um, uh, a, a fantasist and was making up money that he didn't have and investors that he could get. Tom was having Just his own uh, mental breakdown during, on, during on the set, so yeah. being gaslit by this You're guy. halfway through the filming. Exactly, and, and this, yeah. you know, and you feel just like Pete, because, you know, everyone's saying, don't worry, it'll be fine, it'll come. And then there was a final round of funding when we'd, we'd edited the whole film, but the music rights for all of these great commercial songs that are in it um, were just eye-wateringly high. And so it was either a case of replace them with songs that just weren't as good or just go back to investors, find more investment to, to cover that price tag. And that was also really fun because you could show them the film and say, look, this is the film. We need this amount for these songs. Um, was Sandstorm expensive then? Huge. Most of the budget. <laughs> yeah, it was cripplingly expensive, yeah. Um, but but worth it. We, we spent six months trying to find a song that could, could achieve the same thing and it just it doesn't exist. So, yeah. It was very funny. Yeah. Very funny yeah. scene. <laughs> Well, that's, that's lovely. That's an enjoyable interview. It was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you very <laughs> much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Tom, and thank yeah, you, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, well, we're really and we're really excited that the film gets to play yeah. here. It's yeah. an yeah. awesome well, cinema, well, and yeah. A big thank you to Jill Reddy, yeah. who's uh, yeah. who arranged yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the film is out in cinemas nationwide from, from, from 10th of June. Yeah. June. From the tenth of June. Yeah. So we'll enjoy. Yeah. This was the Garden Cinema Film Talk. You can find out more about the cinema screenings and seasons on our website, thegardencinema.co.uk and follow us, send us comments and feedback on our social media, at The Garden Cinema. Thank you for listening.